Well, good evening to everyone joining in. It's great to see you again. Um, and uh, happy 2023 to you all. Um, it's great you can join us all for our first talk of the new year. And we've got a great lineup already for the first part of the year. So I'll say perhaps a little more about that at the end of the talk. Um, as usual, I'm sure we've got people from all around the world. Um, um, hi, Jeanette. Um, so um, we'll just give it a, a, couple, a minute or so while people connect in and that sort of thing. Um, while we're waiting, I would just say welcome, as I have. Um, this is the Society for Church Archaeology. Uh, we put on these talks every month and they are and um, shall remain free. So we're very glad to see you. But of course, um, it beholds me to say that uh, um, if, if you'd like to continue to support us, oh, Galicia, oh gosh, um, um, you know, please do consider joining the uh, society as well as putting on these talks. Uh, we have um, an annual conference, which I'll say a little bit more at the end as well. And um, also our journal, too. Gosh, we've got quite a range of people coming in from the States and Scotland and Essex, of course. So um, that's brilliant. It's great to see you in multiple time zones. And I hope some of you have got slightly better weather than we do here at the UK, because it's been absolutely horrid start to 2023 in a, in a wet sense. Um, OK, just to remind you um, or to let you know in case um, um, you know, you've not joined us before, um, I'll introduce our speaker in a moment. Um, if you have questions and do feel free to ask probing, insightful or interesting questions, don't worry, Morgan, um, <laughs> and, um, just pop them into the chat box as, as you think of them. Rob will then at the end um, select the questions to ask our speaker because we often get very similar questions from multiple people. So he will select the questions and uh, and we'll put them to the speaker. Um, people all connected in, Rob, or is there still some to go? I think we're good to go now. Fantastic. Right. Well, I'll start introducing our speaker um, and also before people put more glamorous places into the chat box, making me feel thoroughly jealous to be here in soggy Yorkshire. Um, our speaker today is Morgan Ellis Lee, um, who is a heritage consultant and a conservation architect. Um, um, she has a first degree in art history from the University of York and an MPhil from Cambridge. So I think she's going to be well qualified to, to present to us tonight. Um, as you hopefully know, she's going to be talking on late medieval English cadaver monuments. So without any to do, I will hand over to Morgan, who will present her talk to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Lovely to see so many of you. Definitely wasn't expecting it. Let's share the screen. There we go. Right. Lovely. Right. So, um, as the title suggests, Food for Thought, an iconographic reconsideration of late medieval English cadaver monuments. <laughs> so, um, well, for the next hour, <laughs> I'll be reconsidering cadaver monuments in the long 15th century, in particular by focusing on English carved lay transi memorials. And I wish to consider those in terms of the Panofsky assertion that these cadavers present an iconography of a late stage of decay. Um, when one conjures a mental image of a cadaver monument, it is tempting to think of bodies with rotting flesh and creepy crawlies riding from the stomach. And whilst these, are, whilst these cadavers are certainly popular in Belgium or Switzerland, the iconographies that play in the continental cadavers do not speak to the well-preserved bodies of English examples. Instead, this paper proposes that English cadavers appear malnourished or indeed hungry. By this way of visual starvation, English cadavers encourage the parish community to feed the deceased's sinful soul with the food of prayer. <laughs> 
a practice of feasting the dead with much earlier Anglo-Saxon origins that did not continue on in the rest of the continent. Existing historiography largely generalizes cadaver monuments, uniformly attributing adjectives like grisly, putrefying and rotting to evoke images of gruesome skeletal figures ravished by worms. This trope can be first noted in Owen Panofsky's seminary tomb sculpture, where he describes the iconography as the deceased as a mere corpse wrapped only in a shroud, which is nearly always divested of all signs of worldly power and wealth, and often represented in the state of more or less advanced decomposition. Panofsky's use of advanced decomposition sets the tone for the iconography one has come to expect of these monuments. For over half a decade, many historians have been quick to describe cadaver tombs in a manner which evokes the moralizing image of a mere corpse ravaged by advanced decomposition. For example, Sophie Oosterwick, very capable, very amazing woman, but put that out there. <laughs> when describing the iconography of a cadaver, has defined the monument as presenting the deceased not in an idealized form awaiting the second coming of Christ, but as a corpse in a state of putrefaction near skeletal or being devoured by worms and other vermin. Like Bonofsky, Oosterwick attributes decay to, deca uh, attributes decay to cadaver effigies, defying the monuments as in a state of purif putrefaction. However, Oosterwick highlights one of the grave mis misgivings of Panofsky's assertion, namely that near skeletal effigies are not the same as those transies being devoured by worms and other vermin. In short, cadaver monuments cadaver monuments possess more than one type of iconography. In the seminal work of Kathleen Cohn, Metamorphosis of a Death Symbol, Panofsky's sweeping argument of a late stage of decay is challenged directly. Instead, Cohn argues for many distinct iconographies that broadly fluctuate depending on date and geographic location. In speaking on 15th and 16th centuries, Cohn highlights multiple differing iconographies. For example, she mentions the emaciated transi was dominant in England, while in Germany and Austria, the corpse figure covered by frogs and snakes became prevalent, and shrouded figures were used in Northern France, Burgundy, England, and the Lowlands. Many French transies were shown riddled with worms. In particular, Cohn highlights the earliest known transi, Francois de la Sara of Bord, Switzerland, as an example of this temporal geographic separation of iconography. This seemingly lifelike body is directly juxtaposed with the cadaverous motifs of frogs and snakes that crawl all over the body and gnaw their way through de la Sara's fleshy skin. Particularly poignant are the perforation marks on the otherwise well-rounded limbs created by the snakes that have burrowed into the flesh and reminding one of de la Sara's deceased status. Cohn argues that as the first examples of a cadaver tomb, the lengths to incorporate these verminous creatures in conjunction with a natural naked body was not a fanciful whim, but a particular iconography with active broader regional influence. First and foremost, frogs and snakes held particular biblical iconographic significance. For example, having deceived and tempted Eve to eat the apple, the serpent instigated humanity's original sin, Genesis 3.1. Whilst frogs were viewed as unclean animals that came from the rivers in the second plague of Egypt, as seen in Exodus 8, and were more widely used as a simile for evil, so three unclean spirits like frogs, as seen in John in Revelation 16 13. But Cohn also suggests that Switzerland's geopolitical relationship with Journey contributed a local dialect to the iconography. This can be seen in The Tempter a young prince who from the front holds an apple of the original sin, and from the back is shown riddled with snakes and frogs as reminders of his association with the devil. Given the highly regional adoption of the tempter and his female counterpart, Frau Welt, it is this iconography Cohn argues de la Sara's cadaver refugee refers to. However, even those historians that focus purely on English cadavers, widely persist with this primary Panofskian discourse, using the gruesome adjectives evocative of a late stage of decay. For example, Eamon Duffy's The Stripping of the Altars focus so, focuses solely on the social and religious landscape of late medieval England, 
but when describing the English cadaver tomb, he still defines the typology as portraying, and I quote, the deceased as a decaying corpse, the skin track, no, the skin stretched tight over grinning teeth, starting bones and empty eye sockets, stomachs bursting open to reveal exceeding, an exceeding horror of worms and unclean creatures. Duffy presents a fantastical gruesome image conflating the decaying corpse with unclean creatures as per the sweeping and generalized genre of European cadaver iconography first encouraged by Panofsky. However, this conflation of iconography is simply untrue with Duffy's decaying corpse referring to an entirely different country and period, i.e. 16th century France, than the unclean creatures of 14th century Northern Europe. Nevertheless, Duffy, su Duffy supports the sweeping iconography of continental late decay by citing the impact of the Black Death and its wider influence in European consciousness. In particular, Duffy cites the infamous work of Johann Husinger, who quotes, no other epoch has laid so much stress on the expiring Middle Ages, on the thought of death, an everlasting call of momentum or resounds through life. Whilst Hutzinger's statement is provocative, beneath the avant-garde rhetoric, Duffy uses Hutzinger's work to highlight an increased consciousness or anxiety around death and its preparation due to the mass depletion of the population that affected all lay orders, irrespective of wealth or status. This moralization of the brevity of life by the everlasting core of Memento Mori was not, of course, singular to England, with circa 25 million deaths in Europe from 1347 to 1352. In an account provided by a 14th century scholar, Angolo di Torre, in Siena, this broader European consciousness around death can be noted. In di Torre's account, in particular, well, is particularly vivid <laughs> and describes how the pandemic's landscape of death that affected the emotional response of the Sienese people. It was a cruel and horrible thing. It seemed almost everyone that once became stupefied by seeing the pain, father abandoned child, wife, husband, one brother, another, and none could be found to bury the dead for money nor friendship. Members of a household brought their dead to a ditch as best they could without priest, without divine offices. And there were also those who, who were so sparsely covered with earth that dogs dragged them forth and devoured many bodies throughout the street. There was no one who wept for any death for all awaited death. De Torre's account paints a sobering image, a city and its populace awash with austerity of death. Whilst fathers abandoned their children, the family members that remained watched their loved ones' corpses buried in unconsecrated mass graves or devoured by dogs in the street. De Tura's account also highlights the lack of spiritual comfort provided by the dead. With the numbers so tremendous and rapid that the divine offices were neglected at a time when they were needed most, rendering the souls of the deceased without any post-mortem care. As such, Detour presents a society unable to feel guilt about the grief of their losses, increasingly growing isolated as they awaited death. This, this anxiety over censure was not just limited to the life lived. As Duffy explains, there was an overwhelming preoccupation of clergy and laity alike, from priest to prince and from parish clerk to pontiff, with the safe transition of their souls from this world to the next above all with the shorting and easing of their stay in purgatory. Duffy's words refer to how the Black Death stimulated a new lay consciousness surrounding the doctrine of purgatory. Whilst the formal acceptance of purgatory was much earlier, in 1254, Duffy argues that the Black Death brought about a shift in the surrounding importance of the individual, with all members of society cut down in equally unrelenting numbers. The concept of purgatory also began to raise questions about the relationship between status and wealth and the moral implications this had on the soul's safe passage. As it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 1934. The increased consciousness due to the rapid death toll of the Black Death is argued by the likes of Duffy, Lawrence Stone, Mark Ormrod, Philip Lindley, Graham Kai and Jamie Jost to argue for a shift in England's artistic, religious and literary production towards the topos of the macabre. In particular, Joss attributes this cultural shift as a method of coping with, with, uh, as a method of coping with the shocking loss 
triggering a vast emotional obsession and cultural change. Now the new norm reached a continually high emotional pitch in religion, literature and art. Consequently, this consciousness surrounding the purgatorial fires accelerated as a coping method, coping method for the Black Death's highly emotional pitch, developed the emergence of social undertones in late medieval macabre, with themes such as the dance of death and the infamous three living and three dead become a commonplace image throughout England. Of particular poignancy is the artistic and literary topos of the disputation between body and worms. A debate poem comprising of 215 written standards, stanzas written in the vernacular tongue of Middle English. The poem is typical of early body and soul poetry, where the souls berate the body for its earthly sin whilst the body decomposes. In this example, the argument is between a body of a noble woman in her grave and the worms who wish to eat her flesh from her life's sins. Worm, oh worms, the body mourned. Why do you thus? Why makes you eat? What makes you eat? By you my flesh is foully adorned, which once was a figure fresh and sweet, right, amiable, fragrant, and always neat. Of all creatures I was loved the best, called lady and sovereign I do test. As to beauty I was lady of worth, from gentle blood, descending in right line from Eve, and of true noble birth. All hearts were glad my presence to divine, men of honour and worship to me did incline, and now here in earth death has come to me, among worms I lie naked, behold and see. To justify her reprimand to the worms who foully adorn her flesh, the noble woman describes her fair visage and gentle blood. However, now that death has come, the narrator expresses her remorse for her pride, Stripped of her titles, good looks, and even flesh, the once noble woman's pride is subdued by the worm she lies naked with, as they remind her of the cost of morality versus the fallibility of worldly luxuries. The poem's moralistic undertone is further accentuated by the accompanying illustration. On one part, an effigy is adorned by the resplendent costume of an English noblewoman, surrounded by shields bearing her heraldic charge and Mike, much like the poem, reminding the reader of the earthly symbols of her status. However, beneath her visage, which is a figure once fresh and sweet, her effigy is instantly juxtaposed with that of her natural body, a rotting corpse wholly consumed by the pestilences of worms and maggots, therefore making plain that a human's flesh is merely an ornament for the ravages of worm, not to be persuaded by one's earthly rank. This food for worms iconography attributed to the mass sociolog uh, attributed to the mass sociological moralization incited by the Black Death did to a certain degree also operate brief patronage in English cadaver monuments. In particular, we have this well-known example of the skeletal shroud brass of Ralph Hampstead, laid in front of the altar in the centre of the chancel of St Andrew's Oddington. Amsley's large Purbeck marble slab displays a stark skeletal corpse whose body is utterly devoid of flesh and infiltrated by a gang of writhing worms. In short, Hampsley's brass presents a horrifying confrontational image of late decease. It is this gross physicality of decay that Duffy argues holds spiritual agency. And I quote, to bring home to the spectator the reality in his own mor morality and how thereby to bring him to a sense of the urgency of his need for conversion, to evoke fellow feeling and pity for the occupant of the tomb. Thus seemingly bursting forth from the harsh angularity of Hampsley's body, the worms having ravaged his corpse discard the skeletal remains forthwith fire his eye sockets, offering up a sobering and confrontational image to remind an onlooker of their morality and their mortality, and the importance a prayer for their imminent fate. This wormy end is also explicitly outlined in his inscription. Here I am given to the worms, and thus I try to show that as I am laid aside here, so is all honour laid, laid aside. As such, there can be a direct parallel drawn with the tone of the dichotomous image and the text in the poem, much like the English noblewoman, Amsley's body has been taken over by the verminibus, 
as a means to present himself as a man who will put all sol- who will put all of his honor to one side. His skeletal image echoing the moralization specific to the social and religious impact of the Black Death. Furthermore, Hampsley, a divinity fellow of Merton College, Oxford, utilizes the sobering redundancy of earthly vanitas and death, demonstrating knowledge of a much earlier clerical train of thought. Strong parallels can be drawn between the worm-ridden iconography of Hampsley's brass and the 12th century tract of Pope Innocence III's De Miseria Conditionis Humanae, the origin of the Contemptus Mundi. Much in the same way as Hampsley's monument and the poem, in his tract, Pope Innocent III directly contrasts worldly glory and man's wormy end. He who just now sat in the gl- glorious throne now lies in his tomb. He who was just now decorated with gleaming gold now lies naked. The man who just now dined upon delights in his living room is now being dined on by worms in his grave. Here, Innocent III explicitly contrasts the several symbols of status, such as the glorious throne gleaming gold, with a vivid image of the naked body lying in the tomb being dined on by worms in the grave. Thus, the tract calls for humility among the great and powerful, reminding them of how their hierarchy in life will quickly be humbled by the worms who dine on their mortal flesh and death. As such, with his brass laid on the floor, St Andrew's Durham, Durham Cathedral, and in Oxford Colleges, Merton, Queens, and University, Hampstead demonstrably heeds the warning of Innocent III and allows his memorial to be walked on to express humility for the sake of his soul's passage through the purgatorial framework accelerated by the Black Death. By occupying the floor space of the lay dominated sphere of the parish church, the Donish clerical community of the University of Oxford and in the Grand Monastic Cathedral of Durham, Hampstead monopolised a diverse prayer economy via this considerable geographic expanse, encouraging the small and mighty to trample over his pitiful visage and remember that they too must die. Although, Borbinski has argued that one should be cautious of this display of humility. By prostrating his worm-riddled corpse on the floor, Hampstead and others who opted for the monumental brass, and I quote, reinforced precisely the social and linguistic differences that death undercuts, whereby clerical patrons deliberately sought out flat but strategically well-placed grave slabs as sign, <laughs> grave slabs as signs <laughs> of Christian humility from the Latin humus meaning earth in clerical guise. Consequently, by placing his provocative likeness on the ground, Hampsley is, according to Binsky, flexing a knowledge of Latin typical for the clerical literati and not the lay masses. Thus, the humility of his tomb's location is shrouded in a clerical guise. The choices of location further insinuate this, with the vast majority of Hampsley's brasses occupying prime spaces in Oxford College chapels. Given the inherently high medieval monastic foundation that developed the educational mission of Oxford Colleges, these tomb slabs were laid at the heart of a clerical intellectual community. The theological students of Oxford able to understand the contemptuous Mundi iconography and the Latin inscription of Hampsley's brass. A brass like Hampsley's, whilst appearing to boast a humility that considers the social toll of the Black Death, merely amplifies a strain of iconography only to be understood by the clerical few. Indeed, this iconography of worm and decay was limited to monumental brasses in England, with Hampsley's only one of two examples. Consequently, this was not an iconography readily adopted en masse, suggesting this was an iconography of Hampsley's monumental brass, was a specific strand of thought with a limited audience. As such, the general movement for cadaver production in England does not partake in the moralising conversation between Hampsley's worm-ridden brass and the living who walk on top, hinting that the message conveyed was only for a small group of people. It is for this reason that Binsky highlights that, and I quote, the essentially democratic theme of death as a leveller embodied in the lament for earthly station, as depicted in the worm-ridden body of Hampsley's brass and the poetry and illustration of the poem, echoes a moralising sentiment that was first and foremost a Donish conceit.
Fundamentally, it's due to this academic elitism that Binsky argues transient monuments are, and I quote, a form of self-reflection, not public address. However, if that were entirely true, then it would make little sense for Hampsley to commission five known brasses, as if for only self-reflection and not public address, it would have been it would have been unnecessary to have maximized the demographic, both the lay audience of St Andrew's Parish Church and the clerical of Oxford and Durham, who would have looked upon this moralizing grisly guise. Ultimately, it does not take a high-minded cleric to work out what the essence of Hampsley's brass depicts. In short, it's a skeletal figure devoured by worms. Indeed, whilst the Black Death undoubtedly exercised a strain of moralistic thought on living society with earlier foundations within the clerical community, scenes of death were by no means uncommon in the late medieval period. Prior to the Black Death, we have the Barons' Wars, and we also have the early phase of the Hundred Years' War, such as the Battle of Crecy in 1346 and Poitiers in 1356, all of which resulted in high death tolls for English population. In particular, the latter took place on French soil, but the former brought, the, brought death to the doors of many English families. In particular, the dispenser war, which took place in the living memory of many who were impacted by the first wave of the pandemic. Thus, the unpredictable, harsh realities of death were not a new concept in England, with the image of foul and rotting bodies having a much earlier catalyst than the Black Death and an iconographic precedent beyond the cloisters. It is therefore a grave injustice to discard a social anthropological inter interpretation of cadavers in favour of the self-reflection of the ecclesiastical few, when it, in when it insinuates a lack of understanding of the iconography and contribution to the macabre by the lay orders. Whilst the average parishioner may not have been familiar with the Latin of an inscription or with the strand of thought specific to Innocent III, they would have been familiar with the moralizing content that inspired the worm riddled typology. The graphic chronicle of Angolo di Toro Siena demonstrates the first hand experience of the dead being eaten by the worms, highlighting the further emotional connection that the deceased would likely be a loved one. Moreover, much more than merely understanding the typology, the lay vernacular poetry of the conversation between body and worms also suggests that the laity were more than capable of patronizing the iconography as a literary topos. In short, it was not a lack of understanding that withheld lay contribution to this iconography, but rather a pointed preference of not adopting it. Indeed, with effigies of worm bringing decay limited to not only two monumental brasses, it was far from popular iconography even among a clerical audience. Therefore, when the likes of Duffy define the English cadaver monuments in terms of the stomach bursting open to reveal exceeding horror of worms and unclean creatures, as part of the more general Panofskian discourse, they overlook the active rejection of the iconography by English patrons, by both clerics and laity alike. Therefore, the consistent absence of a worm room discourse in England suggests an alternate iconography not yet accounted for within this existing historiographic framework. Kathleen Cohn is the first to propose that carved cadaver transies of England confirm, conform to a typology far removed from the discourse of ecclesiastic moralizing rotting. Throughout her work, she refers to, and I quote, the emaciated English prototype, the emaciated transie, that was dominant in England and about the first English double death about the first English double death of transy of Archbishop Richard Fleming, Cohen refers to, and I quote, an upper figure of Fleming in ecclesiastical robes contrasts to a lower figure of an emaciated transy. Whilst Cohen fails to expand on her passing comments, she does hint at an iconography for English cadavers far removed from Panofsky's advanced decomposition and the verminous morality of the Black Death European landscape. This altern alternative iconography can be noted in Fleming's monument, believed to be the earliest in England. Whilst an Episcopal monument, what I'd like to highlight is the intention of the way the body is presented. As Cohn describes, the cadaver is visibly emaciated. When you look at his form, the skin is intact, 
unlike the flayed flesh of the carved cadavers seen predominantly in Belgium and France. And there are none of the worms seen in Hampstead's monumental brass or the frogs of Delassars. What is particularly poignant is that it was clearly intended. The nature of medieval monuments means that there's always a risk that the monuments do not survive as they've originally been intended with historical factors such as the Reformation or even just the human habits of vandalism through curiosity or boredom. Wear and tear heavily impacts the monuments we see in our churches today. However, a drawing made by William Sedgwick only some 150 years after the tomb was finished clearly shows the figure of Fleming with broad protruding ribs, distended stomach and a face which looks as though it's sleeping, not that of a glass, ghastly skeleton. This monument has presented a body that intentionally still maintains a degree of vivacity, and it sets the tone for what can be seen almost across all English exemplars. Right, okay. Importantly, this visual of emaciation is not just prevalent in the early 15th century, it is consistent across England well into the late 16th century, even in later examples of carved cadavers, such as that of Thomas Cure. These telltale signs of emaciation can be clearly seen, therefore suggesting a shared rhetoric. Much like Fleming, the carved cadaver effigy of Cure follows a recumbent format with a single hand holding a death trial for modesty. Even though Cure's monument is not well preserved, the tension of his skin clinging to his bones is still tangible. For example, at the top of his humerus, there is a prominently defined sheath of skin that seamlessly connects to his chest cavity. Completely unbroken, it offers a glimpse of an overall intactness of the skin that is uniform with Fleming's Cadaver effigy. Again, much the same as the illustration of Fleming's tomb, the clavicle, rib cage, and hip bones are hollowed and sunken, easily identifiable due to their angularity. The bones boldly frame the shape of the neck and the stomach in a style that is almost a near identical severity to Fleming's. With such a deliberate style of carving, it is only logical for a viewer to be vertically guided from, by the structure of the effigy. This natural flow encourages one to move from Cure's parted lips down his neck straight to his stomach. It is as if the rest of his body has withered away to create a very deliberate vertical visual path. In short, there is an evident checklist of visual ephemera that these English monuments are following. They're all singing from the same hymn sheet. English cadavers do not, by and large, ever appear with flayed flesh. Oh, oh dear, I've missed a page. What's happened there? Oh dear. Oh Lord, what a change. No, writing. Well, I've lost my page. Um, oh dear. Right. <laughs> oh dear, this is awful. <laughs> Ah, Christina Welsh, foremost, has attempted to decipher the reason behind this emaciated iconography in English cadavers. Welsh comprehensively argues that carved English cadavers do not, by and large, ever appear with flayed flesh or skeletal remains. Instead, Welsh notes that after consulting a forensic pathologist, she has confirmed that English cadavers, and I quote, have been carved to illustrate a recently deceased person, a fresh rather than decomposing corpse. Additionally, they medically resemble someone with severe emaciation. Therefore, beyond the subjectivity of visual analysis, Welsh creates a solid scientific grounding for this individualized iconography of emaciation as seen in English, as seen in English examples. Thus pointedly, one can confidently argue that Panofsky's assertion of a mere corpse in a state of more or less advanced decomposition does not apply, visually or scientifically, to the surviving carved cadavers of England. Welsh further expands on this specifying that, and I quote, all ECCMS have been carved showing their eyes open or half open and as such are not imagined sleeping. This concept is particularly intriguing as Welsh does not just describe the emaciation of cone, but with a cadaver's eyes open or half open, she applies a layer of liminal vivacity to the English transie. 
a betwixt of the present active of dying and the watershed of death and body dissolution. Welsh more specifically argues that this nimnality relates to the Judaic tradition of Gosis, and I quote, notably in Jewish law, the dying and very recently dead are treated as if still fully sentient and have a special status that separates them from the full living and from the fully dead. The eyelids in the process of closing indicate that the patron is in the final stages of the dying process, just as the soul begins to leave the body. Welsh cautions that while she does not intend to apply Judaic traditions to Catholic monuments, the, and I quote, English language does not possess a word for someone in this liminal state. However, this might not necessarily be the case. The late medieval development of the macabre in England highlights lay-centric anxiety regarding the definition of the state of the body and soul in the days before death. As the increased circulation of lay literature to instruct spiritual care at the deathbed highly, highlighted increased anxiety about the status of the dying body. According to Duthie, this anxiety surrounding the finality of the body's dissolution saw the secular shift from caring for the soul after death to the shrift and housel of the body in the days running up to the event. In particular, Duffy highlights the practice of the extreme unction. The Olaean forum of the, or the oil of the sick was implied to the dying person at the point of seemingly irreversible sickness, strengthening the body at near dissolution to provide safe passage for the soul. Consequently, the application of the Olaean forum redefined the state of the individual to the deceased, irrespective of whether they were still medically alive or not. It is for this reason that Duffy remarks that the extreme unction was a final act that censured the lingering body, which rendered the, bo the body as a sort of animated corpse with the soul still lingering within the spiritually deceased's body. This lingering animation was not necessarily temporary either, as, suggest, as suggested by Arnold Angenant, who argues that the medieval corpse, and I quote, was thought to not be completely dead, but to contain some remaining life force. The actual soul, understood as a person's essence, had passed over into the other world, but his second soul remains in the buried corpse. As such, via the second soul, Argendant's assertion comprehensively attaches eternal animation to the deceased corpse, suggesting that the soul still maintained a degree of present active waning. Therefore, instead of the Judaic ghosties, might not we instead say that there's an external eternal liminality of the second soul, neither living nor completely deceased? One could argue that the icon iconography of the English transi relates to the common anxiety surrounding the second soul as an animated corpse of the extreme unction. As such, cadaver bodies are not final, but represent the psychosomatic unit of a body and a soul in the watershed moment of liminal in betwixt status. No better effect can this be seen to than in the cadaver effigy of Alice Delapole in St Mary's Church, Humley, Oxford. In particular, careful and considered choices have been made regarding the materiality and iconographic choices of Alice's transi to suggest the subtle glimmers of vivacity one would not expect from a cold deceased figure. For example, the remnants of rosy hues on Alice's lips and in her mouth and the network of painted blue and pink veins over the body all hint at blood circulation. As Welsh has identified, these signs of blood circulation are only anatomically true of a person within 30 minutes of decease before the blood pools at the lowest point of the body. So Alice's cadaver either presents her immediately deceased body or her body just prior to decease. Moreover, this delicate application of polychromy is essential. Alabaster was well known to take paint owing to the ground gesso layer necessary for the pour of stone. So the very selective applications of pinks, reds and blues in places such as the roof of her slightly open mouth and lips means that the paint creates a thin layer over a semi-translucent alabaster. Therefore, whilst the carved form appears emaciated, 
features such as Delapol's protruding ribs and angular jaw suggest her redefined status post oleanthorium. The soft stone of the alabaster creates a paradoxical warmth that shines from within the stone through the paint. Accordingly, Alice's body does not merely hint at a waning atomical blood circulation as per her spiritual decease, but the inward warmth of Alabaster's materiality also alludes to the inward light of the second soul and the transitional state of her body. However, there's something at odds with the warmth of the material with the angularity of her body. In short, what is the purpose of this liminality? I would argue that the answer lay in the checklist that almost all cadavers conform to. First, a mouth slightly open. Second, going down to a taut neck exaggerated by a deeply defined clavicle. And third, moving down to a severely distended stomach. These are the bodies of people who are severely starved, not people who are dead. To my knowledge, there is not one English cadaver that does not have all three of these things. Moreover, in the case of Alice Delapole, the use of fenestration on her tomb is particularly telling as the way the light is able to pass through the alabaster grate specifically allows you to see only those three areas of her body while sat in the pew next to her monument. As such, she wants the members of her parish to look on the carved muscle, muscle tension of her neck as she opens her mouth. She wants those she loved to see the severity of her starvation and she wants those around her to pity her transitioning stole, trapped in a body frozen on the brink of decease. She is hungry for her soul's salvation and she needs the prayers of her parish to feed her liminal soul so that it may transition quickly. Indeed, the soul's hunger can be seen in Psalm 61, one to four. O God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest foods, singing lips, my mouth will praise you. In particular, what Psalm 61 highlights is that the soul, thirsty and hungry for divine love, can only be satiated by the human body. Therefore, by maintaining her skin, muscles and blood circulation, her cadaver form is fundamentally able to facilitate the hunger and thirst of the second soul and consequently more efficiently reach heaven as her soul satisfied with the richest, richest foods. Indeed, this request on the service of the living to feed the hungry soul of the liminal dead was also outlined specifically in tomb inscriptions. A particularly poignant example is the cadaver tomb of John Barrett where far from mincing his words, he is direct in his plea and explicit about the motions he wants to elicit from the living members of his parish. Wrapped in a sheet, a full ruly wretch, no more of my mind toward will stretch. From earth I came and onto earth I am brought. This is my nature, for of earth I was wrought. Thus earth on earth tendeth net, so endeth each creature called John Barrett. Wherefore, ye people, in way of charity, with your good prayers, I pray you help me. For such I am, right so shall you all be. Now, God and my soul, have mercy and pity. Amen. Unlike the warm liminality of Delapole's polychromed alabaster, the tone conveyed by Barrett's inscription is much more severe and urgent. There is also seen the way of starvation in, depicted in Barrett's body whilst Alice's cadaver operates with a degree of elegant subtlety, there is an additional angularity and severity when observing cadavers, Barrett's cadaver form. For example, what's acutely apparent with Barrett's body is that the skin tightly taut over the angular structure of his bones prevent, presents a view with the exaggerated visual of a distended stomach and a hollowed clavicle so severe that it highlights the strain of the individual tendons on the neck. Where Delapole's monument carried a degree of serenity, Barrett's monument presents a stark severity. The severity is also echoed in the slight grimace of Barrett's mouth, suggesting a degree of discomfort not readily visible in Delapole's transi. Thus, the exaggeration of these features may suggest an urgency to hunger of Barrett's soul that operates in parallel to Delapole's.
as Michael Rimmer suggests, Barrett had a great deal to be guilty for. When, as an executor of the will of Edmund Troubadour, Barrett stole some of the silver endowed for masses for Troubadour's soul and melted it down to create an SS collar. As such, this lingering guilt may answer the severity of Barrett's hunger, the gravity of his emaciation reflecting the gravity of his sin. The soul's hunger to atone for the sin is outlined in Psalms 107. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Their, soul, their souls abhorred all manner of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distresses. Therefore, Barrett's cadaver presents his emaciated body as a simulcrum for the soul that abhorred all manner of food due to the price of its earthly sin as it drew near to the gates of death. Thus, the harsh emaciation of Barrett's stomach presents a self-inflicted state of bodily hunger in the hope that via the um, cadaver's form, the Lord would save him from his distress to make amends for the silver he stole. Certainly, whilst Barrett's limbs and even his face show a degree of fullness, close to that expected of a living person, the respective curvilinear style of these features only further frame the severity of the emaciation of those bodily features integral to digestion. In short, by drastically undercutting the throat and diaphragm, Barrett highlights to the members of his parish the bodily apparatus required to feed his soul and freedom from his guilt and post-mortem distress. Thus, this slightly different visual presentation of bodily hunger in Barrett's monument in comparison to Delapole's, suggests a more comprehensive personalization of the iconography, with the English cadaver souls hungering for different things. Moreover, as a wealthy merchant holder and the um, as a wealthy merchant, the holder of the state of Calais and mayor of London, Barrett fundamentally possessed the finances to be as exacting as he wanted for the presentation of his cadaver. The privilege of choice is evident from his 30-page will which comprehensively instructs the appearance and setting of his tomb and chantry complex in St Mary's. For example, and my body be buried by the altar of St Martin's, named also Our Lady's altar in St Mary's church at Bury, but a bed to be made under the ground where my Lady Shardlow was wanting to sit, the stools removed and the body put in as near under my grave as may be without the hurt of the said grave. What is clear from Barrett's stipulations is that the tomb's location should be prioritised over the location of his actual grave. Whilst Barrett wished for his corpse to be as near as possible to the site of his tomb, he is explicit that his body should not be buried at the expense of damage to his tomb. In short, Barrett prioritised the cadaver's body over his corpse's natural body, which cannot have been without good spiritual reason. With one of the longest wills of the medieval period, and indeed history, nothing was left to chance. This severe angular em emaciation of Barrett's cadaver was not coincidental. Moreover, Barrett's expectations for his location resulted in the church pew's rearrangement, spaces that Barrett remembered regarding specific individuals of the Paris, parish. Therefore, Barrett choosing to be positioned where the congregation used to sit and ultimately redefining the church's space did so that those around him could not ignore his monument and constant, consequent display of guilt. Accordingly, Barrett's stipulations make it near impossible for the parochial congregation not to interact with his emaciated form of his cadaver. His will stipulation further insinuates this audience participation, and I quote, three mirrors of glass to be set above my grave. As such, anyone who stood close enough to look at Barry's Barrett's cadaver form in turn find themselves reflected within the glass onto the emaciated form. Thus, in doing so, Barrett's chantry meant that the viewer would involuntarily become an active participant in the cadaver's discourse on bodily hunger, asking them to reflect on the iniquities of their own souls, just as he has done in atoning for the stolen silver through his hungry soul. This invitation to external interaction is also noted in the vernacular inscription on Barrett's tomb. He that will sadly behold one with his eye may see his own mirror and learn how to die. 
therefore the mirrors call for a constant state of cern tomb speculum or behold thy mirror where the view is superimposed with the hollow features of starvation the mirrors inspire one to reflect on the hunger of one's soul and in turn feed barracks with prayer a communal act of feeding the deceased this concept of feeding the dead has a uniquely English precedent, but instead of prayer, the dead were feasted with food. Christina Lee comprehensively outlines the Anglo-Saxon tradition of feasting the dead, a popular practice that could take place before the funeral, at home in memory of the deceased, or even at a graveyard and over the grave site itself. In the case of the latter, Lee considers the specific grave sites by highlighting the richest graves at Shoebury, the, they contain sheep bones and next to the head of the deceased woman, thus suggesting that the animal remains were thrown into the grave to symbolically feast with the deceased. It is thought that this tradition was then adopted by early Christians, becoming the catalyst for a veneration of the corpse. It is thought that this tradition was adopted by early Christians and much like the Anglo-Saxon precedent, the Christian tradition focused on con congregating at the gravesite, but instead they would do so annually on the anniversary of the death, where families and friends would gather and celebrate with the dead with a feast. Donald Bullough also observes this medieval continuity. And I quote, while sacrifices were unlawful for Christians, ritual meals and recurrent libations at or over the tomb of the dead were not. There is archeological evidence for the continuance well into the sixth century and perhaps even to the time of Gregory the Great. Whilst the period between Gregory the Great and the tomb of Barrett is a significant gap in history, there is no reason to believe that the practice died out entirely or was not reimagined in a different format. Indeed, it appears that England never officially prohibited the practice of feasting. Even when the rest of Europe censured the practice by the eighth century, it was not deterred in England. The clerics of England simply no longer discussed the ritual as opposed to outright demolishing the practice. One could even argue that the practice was not merely forgotten but was in part absorbed into late medieval art of dying well, in particular at the final moments of the de deathbed. Just before the moment of death, the dying Christian was given the Eucharist in the form of bread and wine as, as provisions for the soul's imminent departure. Moreover, a practice similar to feasting the dead is known to persist in the late medieval period, in which individuals who ate the deceased sins were known as sin eaters. These poor men were following in the footsteps of Christ and attempted to absolve the sins of the deceased by eating bread and wine over the deceased's corpse. Although little information survives on the act of sin eating, it was a practice predominantly associated with England. Therefore, there may be reason to believe that even while the practice um, of throwing food or eating food over the dead did not survive to the 4th and 15th centuries, there was a spiritual mentality that lingered in England and its identity with this idea of um, the community feeding the souls of their dead. Ultimately, these practices speak to the human fear of being forgotten. As Duffy has asserted, and I quote, to die meant to enter a great silence and the fear of being forgotten in that silence. As such, even though the formalities have shifted from the Anglo-Saxons through to late medieval Catholicism, the feeding of the dead spoke to a specifically lay culture of remembering those no longer with us through providing food for their safety into the unknown. I think this tradition could provide a reason for the singularity of iconography in English carved cadavers. They do not conform to the shock factor of the fleshy rotting cadavers in Europe to provoke people's prayer, but speak to a very niche remnant of the English past, which after the relenting events of the Black Death and other wars and famines, regained consciousness as people looked for comfort in the old ways. Thank you for bearing with me. <laughs> Oh, yeah. oh, oh, thank you very much, Morgan. <laughs> I do have to stop sharing. Oh, dear. <laughs> Let's stop. <laughs> I'm so there sorry. There we go. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs>
Um, well, thank you very much for that sort of very sort of, uh, you know, very interesting sort of comprehensive overview, and particularly with the sort of the unique nature of the English monuments. And uh, and I, I like the uh, connection with feasting. That's uh, a really, really nice point to conclude on. Um, because time is, is shortish, I'm going to hand over to Rob, who will no doubt have an insightful question. Yes, I've got a couple of good questions. Um, one from John here is, would medieval thinkers um, have considered associations of the soul with the cadaver monuments? Well, sorry, would they have been aware of other theories, sort of independent lines of philosophies? Um, John has quoted the Egyptian theories of Kant and Baal. So... Oh Is yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, um, if we look at pretty much any, even even in England, any major cathedral had um, the scriptoriums, and the scriptoriums would copy these great international works. I mean, even if we're going back to ancient Greece, the long lost library of Alexandria, it's very much the same concept. These ideas are very much swapped and shared, not even just in Europe, but around the world. Oh, thank you. Um, a question I had actually was um, one about how these monuments, I mean, you, you talked a little bit about how these monuments were in some sense sort of commissioned to be with set, set within very deliberate places within church and chapel settings. But I mean, how did they set, how did they work within the sort of the lighting and the sensory experience of, of the church at the time? So I'm thinking sort of candles and things like that. Is there, oh, were yeah. they designed with that, were they designed with that in mind? I mean, it I mean, you've know way more about this than I do, but I think in terms of when you have the like anti chapels or you have particular shrines, a lot of people would ask to be buried next to certain shrines belong to patron saints that the, either they're named off or had a particular closeness to, and as a result, obviously you have tapers within those shrines, you have candles on those shrines, and obviously you're paying um, for. I mean, in your wills, you would stipulate. This is something I really wanted to include, but obviously I ran out of time quite severely. But um, there's a real sort of development in the 14th century around what people choose to put in their wills. There's a, that's sort of the one thing that really comes from the second phase of the Black Death, where you've had the first phase and people sort of gotten over it and they've moved on. And then you've got about 30 years later, you get this second crash. And that sort of makes people really panic. And in that panic, people go, crikey, we probably ought to be putting a bit more in our wills. And as a result, they're stipulating things like candles and prayers and masses to be said next to their tombs. And their tombs are very much part of this network of prayers and candles. So it would have been it would have been originated with that in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's good. Thank you. Um, another question is, I suppose I had another one because I, I am quite interested in this topic <laughs> myself, is... Um, what what aspects of the iconography were carried forward into the sort of 17th century and possibly later? I, I have I do know there are sort of sh shrouded effigies in the 17th century, yeah. but they're not nowhere near as emaciated, of course. But what sort of what was the popularity for that being carried forward? Can you say anything about that? So post Reformation is something I really want to look at. So I'm definitely not an authority on this one, um, but post Reformation they seem to sort of teeter off really sadly <laughs> they don't really seem to sort of carry through and as you said there are some shroud brasses I think mostly it was continued in Ireland which is why I specified English and not <laughs> not United Kingdom but I think mostly they sort of they continue in Ireland obviously because Catholic but um post-reformation I, I don't know what it is about these monuments that make them particularly Catholic um but they, they just don't really sort of continue on so their iconography is just either watered down i.e like a shroud which is point of fact you get a shroud when you die um but yeah i don't have an answer for that <laughs> and i wish i did so if anyone knows by all means <laughs> let me know mm, yeah yeah do. yeah that's all now um <laughs> have we got time for a more, couple more questions you yeah, yeah go we've got for a it. couple um morgan do you see a question from catherine here do you see any continuity from the pre-Roman Christianity and the Celtic wake to the English death feast? Um, I mean, it, oh, sorry, I think there definitely is continuity, absolutely. So I think they're all very much of a similar strain. I think it's 
as I said, I think it's a comfort thing. Like you used to enjoy meals with your families. I think that happens all over the world. And actually, when obviously we're then colonised by the Romans, it's just that these practices get passed on to the Anglo-Saxons. So I think it's just it's the same strain. It was just redeveloped. And it just happened to be that, I think, what well, I think it was 1130, I want to say, Rome absolutely abolished it within um, Catholicism. They said, not, we're not doing this pagan malarkey anymore. We're not going to be feeding people's graves. And it seemed to stop in pretty much everywhere in Europe, except for England. I don't really know how they got away. There's just not enough written on it, which is such a shame, but they're very much seeing these practices continue in England well after Rome's put their foot down, said absolutely no more. But I think they very much all came, very much all came from a, a similar strain of thought. I think it's just something that's been shared and unfortunately teetered off in certain places. <laughs> Mm-hmm. yeah one last question um from george is was the stipulation of mirrors on tombs common and have any survived that is the only one i know of that is the only one i know that stipulated mirrors on a tomb i may be wrong <laughs> that's that's often the case <laughs> but to my knowledge that is the only one it's certainly mm-hmm. the only certainly the only cadaver monument that uses mirrors which is which is why it's so interesting because even now the mirrors survive but they've been reworked so they're smaller um from what's insinuated in Barrett's will they would have been three large panes that would have gone directly over the tomb but the tomb's now been moved and um it's been replaced like starburst so small little mirrors fantastic that's it right great I'm gonna hand back to you now thank you yeah, I'm, I'm, I am not going to get diverted by the discussion of mirrors. That's a conversation <laughs> we're going to have, but because um, medieval mirrors <laughs> are a bit different. Um, anyway, no, thank you. Thank you very much again, Morgan. Um, uh, just a final thing for me to say is, apart from thanking our speaker, is to let you know that our next talk um, next month on the 5th of February is by Kevin Coots. We'll be talking about the archaeological investigations of the chapel burial ground at Poulton in Cheshire. So um, uh, another sort of death related topic. Um, but in the meantime, thank you to Megan, uh, not Megan, Morgan. <laughs> Don't speaker. worry, I've It's uh, been a long morning. day, sorry. <laughs> to Morgan, our speaker. It's Monday thank evening. <laughs> <laughs> thank you to all of you for joining us and we'll hopefully we'll see you next month. Thank you very much.